In the past, I showcased a technique called DLL injection. It allows us to inject a DLL inside a targeted process and then execute the code inside the library just like that. While it was useful when to execute in a situ implant or perform any other malicious activity, it has one major problem and that's it's complex, right? It's not worth it because you have to first drop your files to a directed environment. You have to make sure that all the paths inside the executable are correctly set up. And that makes the whole process just not worth it. So can we do something about it? My idea is to implement DLL injection alongside with staging technique. Staging is a technique that allows us to store files or shellcode on a remote server and then access it when you need it. For instance, you can sh you can stage your shellcode for a remote HTTP server and just send a dropper without any kind of malicious data and when that dropper is executed, it's gonna fetch the shellcode out for the remote server dynamically. We can use the same technique but with an SMB server. Let's first start by explaining the DLL and how does it work. I have a standard DLL project inside my Visual Studio. I have named the file name to be DLL main.c and I also renamed the library to be dsh.c which is the default is C++. But that does not really matter. What matters is how I structure the DLL. So here this is the main DLL function called DLL main and that's initially the main function where the DLL starts based on how you actually engage with the DLL, a different segments of the function are engaged. For instance, if you attach the DLL into a process, this switch case is gonna get triggered and inside that, this function would get executed. And these are all the possibilities that can actually engage with the DLL, but for the most of the cases, we wanna work with DLL process attach. In that case, with DLL process attach, I create a new thread to be equal to my custom exec function. Keep in mind that you cannot directly call functions like that because that's not how DLLs are actually working. And the best way of actually create a function or actually call a function is to use create thread API, which is gonna do that work for you. Now, with that being done, this is the main method of the DLL and I have one custom function as I mentioned, which is called exec. Now, this function is super simple, it's the standard shellcode running function. This is the shellcode generated from MSM Venom command in C format, it's not encrypted, it just stands there as it is right now. And here I have three rows of syntax, so we have the LP void. PADDR is going to be equal to virtual alloc. Here we allocate space inside the memory of the process. Now here we allocate the size of the buffer, which in that case is 460 bytes. We allocate that with mem reserve, mem commit flags, and then page execute read write. We can either read the process memory, write to the process memory, and execute the process memory. Yep, you heard me right. Now, on the next page, we have memcopy. Memcopy is a function that allows us to copy bytes to the memory from the variable or to the variable or to the memory address, just transfer bytes. Now, with that, I can do memcopy, then I, I can specify the PADDR, which is gonna be my destination. So I want to copy bytes to there. Then I have buff, which is my array, which is allocated here. This is my source. And then the size of the buffer. So in a nutshell, that's how the mem copy works. You just send where is the destination, where is the source, and how many bytes you want to transfer. So with that syntax, all this array is going to get copied to the memory. And the next part is, of course, to execute it. To execute it, I use the same create thread API, which I specified just like that. Most of the flags are zero because we don't really need them. And here I just need to specify the address of the allocated memory. With that, our DLL is ready. It's all weaponized and ready to go. So let's transfer that to a share and let's see if it works. On the current machine, I can host an SMB server with in packet SMB server specify the share to be SMB and then specify dot to host the current folder for the SMB server. With that, the SMB server is already up and running, so let me go back and transfer my file. Now I can copy the file and navigate to my SMB server, which is 192.168.64.130, go to the SMB share and just paste my file there. Of course, you can copy it in various ways, but I decided to do it just like that. Now let's pay attention to the actual dropper and let's see what modifications we have. Thank you so much for watching and thank you so much for my Patreon subscriber. You don't have an idea how much that means to me and how much that keeps me motivated to build better and more 
detailed content. So if you have further appreciation for my channel, you can become my patron as well, you can support me and buy me a coffee and of course you can subscribe to my channel. Make sure to also join my discord site where we share a lot of knowledge and experience so don't miss that out. You have my deepest appreciation and let's move on. Well, on the previous example, we had more complex developer, which was able to actually get process on runtime by process name and scan the process structure and so on. It was more interactive. I decided to keep things simple in this video. I use an example based on I read team notes, so highly appreciate you guys. You make an awesome content and I use that POC just to make the thing simple and explain the code better. Now, we have only one main method, nothing else, and we have only two include libraries. We have Windows Stage because obviously we want to need to include the Windows APIs and then the stdo.h because you know that library is super important. Now on the neck on the first rows of the, our main function we have a handle for a remote process we're gonna open and then we have a pivot address p, ad, p address which is going to be the address of the allocated memory. It's kind of something similar as the previous example. Now here this is the most crucial interesting part we can specify the DLL path to be a UNC path. Now, just by specifying a UNC path, it works just like that. First, I got myself into some ideas of actually engaging with some Windows APIs that allows, allows me to read a share in the file and so on. But I decided, you know, why I just don't try to use a UNC path here? And it worked. So we specify the UNC path to the DLL itself and now let's proceed forward to open process. In this API call we open a process specified by our command line argument so we should already know the process ID. As I mentioned that's not the most user friendly code but you know that's most easy for me to explain the code. After we open the process we allocate the memory to the process. The same as virtual alloc, but the virtual alloc EX allocates the memory to a remote process instead of the current one. That's the main difference of the functions. Now we specify the process we opened, we opened, we specify the size of the DLL path, and again, as you can see, we specify the main commit, but this case, this time, uh, we specify page read write only because we don't really need to execute stuff. Then we have write process memory, which is doing the same thing as mem copy, but again for the remote process. So we specify the process, specify our destination, specify our source and how many bytes we want, and that's about it. And then we have one key component, which is thread start routine address. What that do? It, it gets the what library w from kernel 32. So with that call get proc address, we pretty much read a module and then we get the address of its function. In that case, we read kernel 32 and, out and actually get and retrieve the word library w function. Because we, we're going to need the word library because we're doing DLL injection, right? We need to word a DLL into somewhere and basically wording is done with that word library window, uh, Windows call. Then on the next part, we have create remote thread which is actually doing the same stuff as before, but again, for the remote process. Now here we have defined our already open process. We define our address of what library W and then we specify actually the allocated memory, which contains the DLL path. So by using that, it actually reads the DLL and executes it. We then close the handle because we don't want to have any some, uh, any some kind of handle leaks and so on. And with that, our program is done executing. Alright, so my SMB server is being set up, but I want to see if I have my Netcat listener, which I'm not. So I have to set up that as well. I'm going to do NC MVLP 443 and the 443 is the port I already created the shell code with. So if you create the port to be 800, just do 800 there. Now with that, I can go to my command VM and actually compile the code. It is being compiled here, so I can already execute that. But of course, as I mentioned, we need the process to inject our DLL into right. And for that case, I'm going to use Notepad. So I'm going to start a new Notepad process real quick right there. The Notepad PID is 13084. And now let's cross our fingers. Let's do share water.exe and then specify the PID to be 13084. Run that. Injection is set to be done. Now if I go back to my Kavi machine, voila, we have our callback there. 
Now with that flexibility, it's so much easier and we can do so much better stuff. We can have a huge DRL which contains a shell code for Mythic, Havoc C2 or any other C2 framework you want. You can actually dynamically change uh, the DRLs inside and that's gonna result into different payloads to be executed. And now you can be a little bit more free in using that technique. Keep in mind that this is optimized for internal networks only, meaning that most of the environments the SMB traffic is disabled unbound, but if you are already inside a network, this is a super nice technique that can allow you to implement the arrow injection. Now it comes one more thing to do and that's to test it against various AV vendors, so let's drop the dropper and let's see if we can have some detection there. Now, again, I'm gonna do anti scammy but to be honest, I didn't see that to be working for several months. So let me try to actually scan that and see if we can get any results and now we don't. But don't get me wrong, now I have an alternative and that's the Meta Defender Opswat.com which actually does kind of the same weird thing as the actual uh, anti scan me. They say that they don't provide samples so uh, I cannot be 100% sure about that but let's see the results so I'll pull my scanner there and let's see if we can get any detection 2 out of 32 actually found that to be malicious. So let's go to a new to the full report. And we found that the asset and Icarus actually say that hey, that's a bad file. But all other scans, so uh, uh web webroot, uh various sophos, uh all the other stuff say that it's alright. That was from the video, I hope it was useful and insightful to you guys. If that was the case, smash that subscribe and like button and I'll see you right in the next one.